While Peterson isn't really back in the public eye just yet, he, or somebody acting for him, has been posting stuff to his Twitter. And a thought occurred to me while reading through the comments on those posts. There are a fair number of people asking Peterson to come back to speak about what's currently happening between the viral current situation or the more recent, ongoing, but currently big situation. At first, these sorts of tweets didn't really seem more than fans eager to have their idol back. But then something clicked. Wasn't the purpose of 12 Rules to teach people to be independent, think for themselves, not be a product of his damned ideology? And yet, in a year full of rapid-fire situations, where being able to practice media literacy and think critically is essential, some of Peterson's fans are asking for him to tell them how to think. Food for thought. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel! It was certainly nice having a week off, but the sections I came back to for this video? Ooh. If you're new here, hi! I'm Cass, I'm a cognitive psychologist, and I've picked up the pet project of going through Jordan B. Peterson's 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos to critically look at the arguments and reference support to see what's up. In these videos, I use a visual shorthand to help indicate who is talking. This means I'm paraphrasing the book. This indicates I'm giving my response or integrating the book with science. This can be things that Peterson cites directly or things I'm bringing in to get at the concepts involved. Also, quick reminder that a citation needed popping up during a quote doesn't necessarily mean that I disagree with Peterson. It just means that it sounds like he's making a statement based on research in some way, and as such, should be showing his work. Alrighty, enough chit chat. Let's learn how to be more precise in our speech. We start this chapter on being precise in your language with this sort of philosophical quandary. Peterson asks what you see when you look at a laptop, and then provides some examples of descriptions you might give. And then the philosophy hits with, it's only a laptop now. He then basically describes the march of technology, positing that modern computers will look archaic in 50 years, similar to how the computers used in the Apollo missions seem to us now. But how do things go from being a computer to not? It's because of the nature of our perceptions themselves, and the often visible interaction between those perceptions and the underlying complexity of the world. I'm sorry, but what? I'm already stopping this thought train because he is exceptionally Peterson-y in this section, and there's a couple things to touch on. While I could see the case being made that a kid who hasn't learned about the history of computing may not be able to recognize the older, room-sized computers, it's not like those behemoths stop being a computer because they're outdated. And maybe this is his extension of some grand philosophical pondering of things that have outlived their utility, intersecting with planned obsolescence that I'm not sophisticated enough to be aware of. But if you see a 10-year-old computer, it's not like you can't understand that as a computer. And if this is about utility driving perception, broken computers are likewise understood as computers that are broken. And we'll come back to object perception and recognition in the next section, so we'll get back to this. Peterson says that your laptop is only a small cog in a greater interconnected system. And if one of those other connections goes down, like your local power goes offline, your laptop loses its functionality. Furthermore, the factories that make the laptop's parts are still in operation. The operating system that enables its functions is based on those parts, and not on others yet to be created. Its video hardware runs the technology expected by the creative people who post their content on the web. Your laptop is in communication with a certain specified ecosystem of other devices and web servers. Initially, I had written a detailed response to Peterson going point by point, but you know what? Let's mix it up. So. There is a bit of a dance of all the different parts that end up resulting in a computer. The OS is written assuming general parts, like some sort of CPU, RAM, video card, etc. But it's not built on specific parts. That's why you can ship a Theseus your computer, as long as the parts are compatible and the driver works with the OS. 
If the OS couldn't handle future hardware, we would need a huge overhaul to the OS every time a new piece of hardware rolled out. I don't think this was part of Peterson's discussion here, but electronic devices, particularly phones, have a built-in planned obsolescence in that the newer operating systems just require more and more resources to run, and older devices can't handle that. Plus, there's the good chance that if your device is old enough, it's not even supported by Google or Apple or whoever. Finally, the vagueness strikes again. Depending on what Peterson means by technology, this sentence could make sense or not. If technology is software, I guess the content creators do have expectations of what they need. But how often do you hear software or an app called technology? And finally, all this is made possible by an even less visible element, the social contract of trust, the interconnected and fundamentally honest political and economic systems that make the reliable electrical grid a reality. This interdependency of part on whole, invisible in systems that work, becomes starkly evident in systems that don't. I hate to think about the bureaucratic paper trail nightmare that lies beyond the contracts I have signed with internet providers, power suppliers, and streaming services. For instance, I live in California, so my power is supplied by Pacific Gas and Electric, or PG&E. Last year, they decided to shut off people's power with very little warning for uncertain periods of time. And they did it so haphazardly that there's even a death associated with these outages. My understanding was that this was done somewhat as a retaliatory measure for PG&E being blamed for some of the fires that happened the year before because of outdated and broken equipment. So I'm having trouble accepting that corporations are acting honestly. The higher order surrounding systems that enable personal computing hardly exist at all in corrupt third world countries, so that the power lines, electrical switches, outlets, and all the other entities so hopefully and concretely indicative of such a grid are absent or compromised, and in fact make little contribution to the practical delivery of electricity to people's homes and factories. This makes perceiving the electronic and other devices that electricity theoretically enables as separate functional units frustrating at minimum and impossible at worst. This is partly because of technical insufficiency. The systems simply don't work. But it is also in no small part because of the lack of trust characteristic of systematically corrupt societies. This seems like another instance of flipping the cause and effect. The corrupt society didn't spring up out of people not trusting each other. It comes from a complex of factors. And this discussion of corrupt third world countries would almost imply that this corruption is absent from the more developed countries, which is laughably not the case. But it's possible that this talk of power grids and corruption in developing countries is to underscore the idea that the West is the best, but only if we're good little girls and boys and don't go rocking the boat. Also, in developing or developed countries, there's power generators. You can supply your own electricity. And back in my WoW playing days, some of the people in my guild lived out in the middle of nowhere enough in both the States and Australia that their only internet option was satellite. We're a crafty species. If we want something, we'll do what we can to get it. Anyways, Peterson analogizes the laptop to a tree's leaf saying that you can interact with the leaf as its own thing, but that percept is misleading. There would be no leaf without the tree, as evidenced by the leaf eventually falling apart when removed from the tree. This is the position of our laptops in relation to the world. So much of what they are resides outside their boundaries that the screen devices we hold on our laps can only maintain their computer-like facade for a few short years. Almost everything we see and hold is like that, although often not so evidently. Yeah, a non-network computer or phone or whatever at this point is somewhat useless, depending on what you're trying to do with it, but a computer that's no longer on the bleeding edge of technology is still a computer. Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! I also don't see what the impermanence of practically everything relevant to our timescale has to do with being precise in your speech. So much for precision. You ready for the Peterson claim, me counterclaim with science dance? 
Good, because that's going to be the rest of this video. We assume that we see objects or things when we look at the world, but that's not really how it is. Our evolved perceptual systems transform the interconnected, complex, multi-level world that we inhabit not so much into things per se, as into useful things, or their nemeses, things that get in the way. Hello, Lab Goggle Pikachu. Long time. No see. Okay, so to talk about what we need to talk about in this section, we're going to hit the high points of spatial vision and form and object perception and recognition. Also, I'm going to try to do this a little different than how these science chunks usually go. Because Peterson's sort of riffing off of one idea as we go through this section, I'm going to break up the science as we go instead of doing one big info dump at the beginning. Visual tasks, especially in perception, do tend to gravitate around objects. Sort of like Peterson said. Kind of. And we can break those tasks down into detection, discrimination, and identification. Detection is the simplest, where you're just picking out an object from the surrounding stuff, like a star in the night sky or cars in a parking lot. All you really know at this point is if an object is there or not. Discrimination happens when you need to be able to distinguish the object from others. Identification is when you tie in the specific label, name, or identity for that object. In the previous quote, it's probably fair to say that Peterson's talking about objects at the discrimination level, useful versus in the way. But what is useful or in the way is highly context dependent. If I'm cold, a sweater is useful. If I'm hungry, a sweater is in the way. This is something that will be popping up on my side of things a couple times in this video, so it bears repeating. What is useful is context dependent. The detection discrimination identification flow reflects the flow of information in the brain. The relatively simple information is built up in complexity until we can attach meaning to it. Something I'm getting stuck on is the distinction between objects as things and objects as purpose-driven things, with Peterson seeming to claim that only the latter is valid. I have been wrestling with this, trying to figure out how to approach this and what to say. Coming at this claim from a perception or cognition-informed angle isn't helping. And I think the issue is that we don't tend to put the research into this objects need utility framework, which would suggest that we perceive objects without them needing to have some utility to them. Finally, of course, objects are split into two categories by Peterson, useful or in the way. It needs to be remarked that categorization is an entire subfield of research within cognitive, and so boiling down all the different theories and ways that we can categorize things into useful or in the way is incorrect. Just because something can be a tool doesn't mean that's the only way it's perceived. This is the necessary, practical reduction of the world. This is the transformation of the near infinite complexity of things through the narrow specification of our purpose. That is not at all the same thing as perceiving objects. Being able to pick out the object from the foreground is something that comes pretty naturally to us, at least if you have normalish vision. But this is an incredibly complex process, as illustrated by all the starts and stops that we've seen in trying to get AI to do this. Something that, funnily enough, Peterson will touch on in a footnote later. We use many monocular and binocular cues to help us do this. Monocular meaning it can be done with one eye, binocular requiring the use of both. These cues range from things like differences in reflectivity, changes in texture, occlusion, perceived size, yada yada. Also, we reduce the world in a lot of ways, starting with just trying to get the information into our eyeballs. The world is a 3D space, while our retinas are 2D. The third dimension is lost when you hit the back of the eye, beyond hints from how things look from a certain point. It's like Peterson's trying to occupy a space between object perception and cognitive categorization and flipping between the two. We don't see valueless entities and then attribute meaning to them. We perceive the meaning directly. Let's see. The references in 160 are a Gibson visual perception book a neuropaper on language perception, and a theory paper about the hierarchy between cognition and the brain. So we're going to skip the Gibson visual perception book because I don't have my copy. I haven't had it in like 10 years. Damn, moving four times. Although if someone wants to throw a copy at me, I wouldn't complain. But we will talk about the other two papers. The Flowell, 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 First, paper was testing a possible explanation for how speech developed in humans. 
This theory is that spoken language evolved out of communicating through gestures. The authors argue that if this theory is correct, then listening to speech should activate the extended articulatory manual action perception network, which they also refer to as the hand motor system. Long story short, they found that the hand motor system was activated by speech perception tasks. To bring this back to Peterson's inclusion of this paper, it's doing nothing to support his claim that we perceive an object's meaning directly, or that this is talking about action like he is, as from the book's back matter. The motor activation found in this paper was regarding producing gestures, not interacting with objects. The second paper is putting forward the position that cognition is built from action and perception on sensory and motor brain mechanisms, as opposed to cognition being in charge with everything else being subservient. The bulk of this paper is on action perception circuits, which are linkages between many different brain regions serving motor, sensory, and higher cognitive areas. Specifically, how these action perception circuits can explain what is known about how language and other cognitive functions work. As with the previous paper, this article doesn't support the claim that Peterson's trying to make. And while we're here, let's clarify something. And yes, I have my pedantic pants on. Perceiving the meaning directly is an oversimplified, incorrect statement. How to even tackle this? The thing I'm tripping on in this quote is that which sentence is correct depends on your time scale. If you're looking at this from our general sense of how we see stuff, it can feel like the meaning is baked into the object. But if you look at the research on this, there's a lot more going on. There's an important distinction in object recognition based on where the information's coming from. And we talk about this as either coming from the bottom to the top or from the top down. So bottom up processing is stimulus driven. You have the information coming into the sensory system and it's processed a little bit, but passed upstream. Top down is your cognition influencing how you perceive that object. And so things like your memories or expectations can change how you see stuff. Here's an example of this. You should be able to read and make sense of the sentence, even though there are a couple of ambiguous stimuli. The H and A are the same perceptually, but because of the surrounding context, you're able to read it. So no, you aren't able to perceive the meaning directly. Context is just one of the things we use to infer meaning. Peterson then gives examples of things and their perceived use. And I'm including this quote verbatim because I'm not sure of something. We see floors to walk on, and doors to duck through, and chairs to sit on. It's for this reason that a beanbag and a stump both fall into the latter category, despite having little objectively in common. We see rocks because we can throw them, and clouds because they can rain on us, and apples to eat, and the automobiles of other people to get in our way and annoy us. We see tools and obstacles, not objects or things. <laughs> I assume that Peterson's not implying that these are the only functions of these objects, but from the way it's written, it could be understandable if that was inferred. Categorization, which is roughly what Peterson's talking about here, is a whole other can of research worms. As with so many things in cognitive, there are a handful of theories trying to explain how we structure our knowledge. One is the Parallel Distributed Processing Approach, or PDP for short, which is sometimes also referred to as the Neural Network Approach. Under PDP, the different items Peterson has listed would have nodes, which are sort of like info tags in this case, for the different uses he gave. But they would also have other properties. Rocks can be thrown, sure, but we can use them to hit other rocks, we can build with them, they can be decoration, they can even be pets. Rocks have a ton of uses and not all of them are as a tool. Just because something can be a tool doesn't mean that is its only category identity. Furthermore, we see tools and obstacles at the handy level of analysis that makes them most useful or dangerous given our needs, abilities, and perceptual limitations. <laughs> the world reveals itself to us as something to utilize and something to navigate through, not as something that merely is. I guess this is why Peterson included the references back in 160 that he did. But as we covered, this isn't what those papers were talking about. The almost sad thing is, this isn't wrong. When you look at an object, your brain prepares a whole bunch of motor responses on what you can do with that object. And some of these motor responses are handy. And then there's a neurological process that happens that lets certain responses through. And sometimes it's a handy response that gets through, sometimes not. Had Peterson been more responsible in his citing, 
this critique could have been avoided. However, context determines the utility of things, it's not a constant, and things can be more than tools or something to be utilized. Granted, he does have that given our needs in there that does hint at context playing a role, but I suspect he would constrain it to utility-based contexts. Something else I'm not clear on with Peterson's apparent approach to categorization is how a young kid is supposed to interact with the world. His approach requires that we have knowledge of how the different things are utilized, but we're not born knowing how to chuck rocks. How does a kid see things if they don't know the utility? Anyways? I made so many involuntary sigh sounds working through this section. We see the faces of the people we're talking to because we need to communicate with those people and cooperate with them. We don't see their microcosmic substructures, their cells, or the subcellular organelles, molecules, and atoms that make up those cells. Silly me, thinking I'd get through the first half of this chapter in this video. Faces do seem to be a special type of object that we are well-tuned in recognizing. So much so that we can see faces in things that arguably don't have faces. An occurrence referred to as pareidolia. And this is probably because we're a social species that needs to be able to discriminate between people and quickly read a face and the emotions it's displaying. But this part about not seeing their micro-components is absurd. The need for organisms at our scale to be able to see at the cellular, you know, fuck it, the atomic level is practically non-existent. Our vision is tuned to the environment we live in. We see stuff at our scale. Being able to discriminate a hydrogen atom from a carbon atom isn't something we need to do. Compound that with what it would take for our visual system to be able to resolve things at that level, and why did he think this was the best counter-argument for why we see faces the way we do? We don't see, as well, the macrocosm that surrounds them, the family members and friends that make up their immediate social circles, the economies they are embedded within, or the ecology that contains all of them. <sighs> The social information for the people we interact with is useful to know, but how would this be visualized naturally? Maybe we don't see that because it's not something that can be seen in this sense. Finally, and equally importantly, we don't see them across time. We see them in the narrow, immediate, overwhelming now, instead of surrounded by the yesterdays and tomorrows that may be a more important part of them than whatever is currently and obviously manifest. And we have to see them in this way, or be overwhelmed. On the one hand, sure. Given how the visual system works, it's a very transient experience for any moment in time. On the other, I'm going to counter Peterson's point using kids. If you're on the younger end of my audience, this may be something you've only been on the receiving end of so far, but it's amazing when you get to see it. Periodically seeing kids, let's say once a year, it's shocking how much they can grow in that time. It's so shocking because we do see them across time. We have a memory of what they looked like the last time we saw them, and the more grown now. But this is again pulling the top-down processing component of object recognition, specifically memory. Repeating a claim he made earlier in the book, Peterson says that we are scraping by with the minimum amount of perceptual information. Enough is a radical, functional, unconscious simplification of the world, and it's almost impossible for us not to mistake it for the world itself. But the objects we see are not simply there in the world for our simple, direct perceiving. A psychologist needs to be careful with the use of jargon like unconscious. As touched upon in other videos, unconscious can have a different meaning depending on what type of psychologist you're talking to. I'll assume that he's meaning unconscious in the sense that this simplification isn't happening at a conscious, explicit, willful level, but it's happening without our intent. I'm watching you, Peterson. Don't go flipping this to the Jungian version of unconsciousness later. Our perception of the world isn't a completely faithful representation of it, so partial point to Peterson here. And a couple examples, because otherwise we'd be here all day. Your brain takes a lot of shortcuts. There are wavelengths of light that we are unable to see, but other organisms can. We may feel like we're perceiving things the moment it's happening, but there's actually a little time lag due to the time it takes for info to make its way through the system to the point where you have the percept. Then there's all the different ways our perception can be tricked through illusions, which can be enlightening for the shortcuts used in processing. The footnote in this quote is about getting AI to be able to see, and how it illustrates the complexity of parsing the visual world. 
Brooks was one of the founders of iRobot, which is responsible for Roombas, among other things. I am absolutely not an expert in computer vision, so I can't speak to Brooks's proposal being the thing that helped the field progress. But a handful of articles and Wikipedia don't mention this embodied cognition idea as being the driving force behind the progress. One even specified deep neural nets as being the crucial piece. So yeah, make of that what you will, I guess. Objects exist in a complex, multi-dimensional relationship to one another, not as self-evidently separate, bounded, independent objects. Has he been hitting the chaos toad again? We perceive not them, but their functional utility and, in doing so, we make them sufficiently simple for sufficient understanding. It is for this reason that we must be precise in our aim. Absent that, we drown in the complexity of the world. Functional utility is dependent on the context you're in. Unless you have a deficit in your ability to filter sensory information, not having a precise aim in how you're going to use the environment won't drown you in the world's complexity. Objects can be more than tools. We can perceive them outside their functional utility. And we don't perceive this meaning directly. It's not an inherent property of the object. Told you these would be repeating ideas. This utility argument is expanded to our perceptions of ourself, and he says that we feel like we end at our skin, but this can shift to include objects or tools that we pick up, and so we can extend our perceptions to what we're feeling through that tool or object. In a shocking deviation, Reference 161 supports the argument that Peterson's making, and I'd heard about this somatosensory property prior to this, so it checks out. Furthermore, he claims that we also get possessive over the tools that we use, and his example here is getting mad at somebody who bangs on your car. My perception of the negative feelings I get when somebody fucks with my car don't feel like it's coming from a place of me being messed with directly. I think it's a combination of sadness for my car being messed with, upset that some people in the world can be so careless or hurtful, and frustration and maybe anxiety about having the funds to cover whatever got broken. And part of this is certainly because I tend to anthropomorphize things like my car, but for things I don't do that to, there's also just my upbringing rearing its head. There's this fear or anxiety that if something gets messed with or broken, we can't replace it. It's just, it's gone. Basically, the distinction here is the why behind the negative emotions. To Peterson, a potential dent in the car is a potential dent in ourselves because we have extended ourselves into the car and therefore get upset. To me, the utility of the car hasn't changed because of a dent, but because I have an emotional attachment to it, I get upset when somebody messes with my metal friend. The extensible boundaries of ourselves also expand to include other people, family members, lovers, and friends. A mother will sacrifice herself for her children. Is our father, or son, or wife, or husband more or less integral to us than an arm or a leg? We can answer, in part, by asking, which would we rather lose? Which loss would we sacrifice more to avoid? We go from a perceptual property, where our body adjusts to accommodate things we're using, to an armchair philosophy discussion of how attached we are to the people in our social circles. Okay, seems a bit like an apples to oranges comparison to me. Also, it allows one to make a hierarchy of body parts and family members. Like a really morbid version of one of those rating things that were popular a couple months back. Peterson snuck a hierarchy in here. Trixy bastard. Peterson then shifts this to saying that we practice these sorts of extensions through fiction, an idea that we've talked about on this channel before, which I was exposed to through folding ideas. We can also be imaginary creatures. Not sure how this is relevant to precision and talking, but okay. This identification is then brought into group identity. With favorite sports teams doing a sports. The winning goal will bring the whole network of fans to their feet before they think in scripted unison. It is as if their many nervous systems are directly wired to the game unfolding in front of them. Fans take the victories and defeats of their teams very personally wearing the jerseys of their heroes, often celebrating their wins and losses more than any such event that actually occurs in their day-to-day -day lives. This identification manifests itself deeply, even biochemically and neurologically. 
vicarious experiences of winning and losing, for example, raise and lower testosterone levels among fans participating in the contest. Our capacity for identification is something that manifests itself at every level of our being. Reference 162 is a paper on testosterone changes in fans. So far, so good. The methods and results check out. I don't have huge problems with the methodology, although it's unclear if participants were allowed to drink alcohol during the game. The results don't seem fishy, their statistics make sense, and support their argument. My personal experience watching or attending sporting events is that these sort of responses don't happen without conscious thought from me, although admittedly, I might be a bit of an odd duck in this regard. I'm also curious why this is the only angle Peterson talks about this group identification in. I would think in-group, out-group dynamics would also factor in here and with what's following in the book. Then there's the predictable 90 degree turn. To the degree that we are patriotic, similarly, our country is not just important to us, it is us. We might even sacrifice our entire, smaller individual selves in battle to maintain the integrity of our country. For much of history, such willingness to die has been regarded as something admirable and courageous, as a part of human duty. About that. I live in a country that's pretty gung-ho about its military, but it's important to keep in mind that the military experience isn't equal for its service members. Basically, people from lower SES groups were more likely to see combat and be killed than those from the higher tiers. And that's just recent history. You go further back, and there's concepts like impressment, where men, typically from the lower classes, were forced into military service. Given the economic coercion or outright force in getting people to enlist, you could see a need for the powers that be to emphasize the nobler aspects of service to encourage people to go along with it. There's also the issue of protecting a country and its allies versus policing the world. And this is something the U.S. really needs to have a long, hard think about because forcing freedom on other countries hasn't been our most successful endeavor to date. And calling this central to human duty is tiptoeing towards jingoism. Paradoxically, that is a direct consequence not of our aggression, but of our extreme sociability and willingness to cooperate. <laughs> If we can become not only ourselves, but our families, teams, and countries, cooperation comes easily to us. Relying on the same deeply innate mechanisms that drive us, and other creatures, to protect our very bodies. He says military stuff is cooperation, not aggression. I say it's more complicated. One thing I want to highlight, though, is this is a group identity. Feeling some sense of belonging to the country you're born in, or immigrated to, is a group identity. Doing things to promote your group in relation to others is apparently okay to Peterson in this context. Last thing is the claim that serving in the military and actively fighting for the country is relying on the same mechanisms as defending ourselves. I guess if you're out there in active combat, it would rely on the same things because it's your ass on the line. And maybe some who enlist do feel that they are protecting their country's ideology and way of life, but we can't ignore the other factors that would lead to someone signing their life over to the government. As previously mentioned, the US and some other countries have some pretty strong economic incentives for joining up. Housing, healthcare, GI Bill, other stuff. And these things would mean a lot more to somebody coming from a lower SES than somebody who's never had to worry about these things in their life. Alrighty, that's it for the first part of Rule 10, Be Precise in Your Speech. And I'm sure we'll get to that precision in speech at some point, even if it's the last sentence in the chapter. I have some general channel business before getting to the actual end of the video. Given the response to one of my recent videos, I'm sure you can guess which one, I'm having to take a step back from the comment section. I'm not sure if this is going to be the new normal for me or if it'll ever go back to a kind of chill space. In either case, if you would like to increase the odds of me seeing and responding to your comment, subscribe! YouTube has added a little flag next to subscribers' names to make it easier to find those comments in the interface. You can also catch me on Twitter or my Discord server, links are in the description for those, as well as my Patreon. And please, don't feel bad if you can't or don't want to join my Patreon. Feeding the algorithm with a like, a view, whatever is plenty. Alright, 
So ending the video for real this time. See you guys in the next one. Bye.